Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Workflow Show. It's been quite a while since we had one of these, but it's great to be firing these up again. Uh, and just for all of you out there who might be new to the Workflow Show, what is the Workflow Show? Well, it's the show where we talk about all the tools and tips and techniques that are involved in motion design. And today I'm really excited to have on as guest Rick Barrett from Maxon. He is the group product manager over at Maxon, and uh, he's a little bit under the weather today. So I'm like <laughs> so thankful for him to uh, join us here. Uh, but uh, yeah, so Maxon just came out with a brand new version of pretty much all of its, like across all of the product lines. Uh, we got new stuff to look forward to and to talk about today. Um, and that's basically it. And I just want to remember, uh, remind everyone that we are going to be taking your uh, questions as well. So we are live here. We have a pretty active chat here already. Uh, we have uh, Michael, also from Maxon, uh, from Red Giant. So good to see him. Carlo, Sharon. Uh, we got uh, Fab Kelly and uh, a bunch of other people we got people from san diego from france so people from all over the world good to see uh everyone nashville heck yeah um texas so really excited uh to chat all things and yeah thanks for everyone for showing up today and uh yeah thank you rick for for showing up as well um <laughs> yeah thanks, yeah thanks for having me and i do have my cough drops right here cough ready drops to go, ready so to go power through this <laughs> <laughs> um, but I am not going to let anything stop me from talking about all of the exciting features in the Maxon 2023 releases. Yeah, I mean, I, it's it's incredible. Like the past release that was earlier in April, that was 26. Yeah, 26 in April. Yep. And then we are 26.1 in June, which a lot of people missed because it right. wasn't the schedule that we're used to. Yeah. Um, but we actually released some features back in June with 26.1. And then uh, followed it right up with 2023 uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so I mean that's the that's the the big change is that we're going from that old uh, using the R's and the S's and the 25s and 26s to more of like the Adobe convention where it's like the 2023. So uh, a little bit of clarity as far as like knowing when those releases came out. I remember. You know, when everyone would reminisce about like, oh, what was the first version that you used of Cinema 4D? And I think for me, that was maybe R9. It was when, you know, all the modules were separate. Dynamics was separate. Um, the uh, box but now, was now you, now, Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Came with a manual about that thick. Yep. Um, but yeah, now you can actually date uh, the first version that you used or uh, when things came out. Um, yep. And mostly it's it's because we're shipping so frequently now, right like with 26.1. It just was getting unwieldy, you know, with two, even two releases a year to be upgrading the version number all the time and to not have it be clear whether there's features in that version or not. So now every September we're going to upgrade to the model year and then anytime that next digit changes, you know that there's new features in the release. So it'll be like 20. So the next... Uh, update would be 2023.1 or something along those lines. The next update with features. Now, if we come with out with features. a hot fix in the meantime, that would be 2023.0.1. Um, mm, okay. But uh, but yeah, the, the whole idea is to make the versioning a lot more clear and to not have the uh, the numbers just continue to go up and up and up and up and up like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, it just reminds me of how old I am because every, every new number is just like, I, I grow another number as well, so... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's let's dive into it uh, because there's I mean, there's a ton of updates in uh, 2023 um, and I, I, I kind of have I'm saving some of my favorites for last, but I figured we could start right where uh, all the quality of life updates are happening. And I mean, th there's been so many awesome quality of life updates over the past few releases, like I feel like since. 25 with the redesigned UI that makes everything a little bit more streamlined. And then like every release is just really stacking on uh, those quality of life uh, updates. And I think one of the things that like me personally, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about, I love uh, modeling characters and, and doing stuff like that. And uh, one of the big, huge updates was 
I guess you could call it like universal symmetry, like a new symmetry uh, modeling system. Uh, yeah. And I get you want to share your screen there and shows off some of this stuff. Yeah. Let me uh, let me grab the scene file for that here real quick. Yeah. But this is like, you know, if you wanted to model with symmetry, I believe the only thing that you could really uh, you could use a symmetry object. And Actually, that was, we'll, we'll just you know, start from scratch here. Cool. Um, and then you could model with symmetry with the sculpting tools, but now it's like literally anything you want to do, you could use this new, uh, symmetry system. Uh, and it's, it's pretty incredible and I'm, I'm already using it a lot. Um, you know, if you work with symmetry, you don't need a symmetry object and then make it editable and all that kind of stuff. So here we go. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've just got a basic model here that I've created and we can go in here to the symmetry hub and turn on symmetry. And just to make sure that it's super clear what's going on, I'm going to turn on the show planes option. And you see this red plane here showing that we're now symmetric, we're symmetrical on X. So as I'm hovering the mouse over, you see all of the, you'll, you see the other side updated and we can go on Y and Z as well so that we're, we're doing symmetry on all three planes at once. Um, and so it's, it's really just seamless. You just go in and start modeling. Um, mm -hmm. you, uh, we can uh, select some polygons here and extrude them in. We can, uh, the cool thing is that it works with the, uh, all the great new modeling tools we added in 26 as well. So things like mm -hmm. fit circle. So we can inset here. We can right click and choose fit circle. We can fit that I circle. That fit circle, fit circle is can... like use that all the time. And then um, we, you know, we've got the new bridge tool now. If I try to bridge here right now, uh, it's not going to work because it needs both of those to be selected. But what I can do is symmetrize the selection. Um, so if we go down here to select and symmetry selection that's uv that's a shortcut i think people are going to use a whole lot that turns mm -hmm. it into real selections and so then we can go into the bridge tool and bridge from one side to the other and then of course this new bridge tool has this awesome ability to adjust the tension so you can add curvature into your bridge um and and just as easy as that we've we've modeled that um so yeah, it's it's super uh, cool to just uh, you know work with this very um, you know seamlessly. All the modeling tools work. Uh, there's also a topological symmetry option. So oh, okay, if we go in here and uh, use the edge mode, and you notice that I mean no plane would allow us to model with symmetry on the shark because it's right, bent, right. Organic but event. I can go in here and turn on topology and edge mode, use just that single edge selection to give it a direction of symmetry. And now if I go in and start selecting, you can see that we're able to select symmetrically. And the real power of this is not even just in, in situations like this, but you can do it in a very localized fashion. So if I want to you know, work symmetrically on the fin here, all I have to do is go in and select an edge here on the fin and set the selection there. And same thing, you can see that now I can select and the bottom of the fin oh, is selected wow. in the same way. So a lot of power here. Um, and then also, you know, when you are working with planar symmetry, but... Uh, maybe, you know, the object space or global space doesn't fit. The work mm -hmm. plane option is really cool. And that combines with the uh, options here in the work plane where you can align the selection to work plane. So you can really easily sort of reorient your plan or symmetry with those commands. So it's not like you have to have your model dead smack in the center of your scene all the time. Like you can, you can have something like this. It's not uh, you know, it's deformed. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the center of your scene. You can adjust the workspace uh, to do just that. 
Yeah, totally. And, uh, you know, here's a here's a model of a crate that someone spent a little bit more time on than that one I was just showing. <laughs> I mean, um, you were you were on your way there. It was looking pretty and, good. And uh, we also have this new option called symmetrize. So if you're modeling just on one side of the model, you can go in here and actually uh, symmetrize. And by default, this will link with your settings in the hub. So you can easily run the command without having to open this, you know, cogwheel menu. But you can symmetrize across any uh, work plane, you know, from X to Y to Z. Uh, so we'll just go all three um, and hit OK. And you can see that oh, just wow. like that, we've mirrored that across all three planes. That's and it awesome. already automatically does the welding and everything. So, so I mean, the, these symmetry to to... tools are really fun. Really yeah, really I mean, fun. that's a one-click solution. And before, you would have to create what three different symmetry objects and make sure all the axes were aligned and, and selected the right way and then make editable. Um, this is, this is like a huge, like th these things like this are such huge quality of life improvements, especially if you like to model a lot. Um, so yeah, this is the, I, I can't wait to dive in more of this. I think the team did a really amazing job with all the symmetry stuff and like adding functionality that I didn't even think I need I, that I knew that I needed and you just it's just in there and it's like oh yeah of course that, I would need that that's great um yeah. speaking of other huge quality of life features and this is something I feel like anyone who's been using cinema 4d for as long as I have or um even even newcomers to cinema 4d like you understand the power of cinema 4d is the procedural nature in which you can you can work and one of the one of the big things that always used to interrupt that whole procedural stacking process of generators and and keeping things live and parametric was was if you needed to do you know use vertex maps which of course with with fields and the ability to use fields to edit vertex maps you would need to make your object editable same thing with uh, polygon selection tags uh, vertex selection uh, tags and edge selections that is a thing of the past because now you can actually procedurally generate vertex maps and polygon selection. So that means that you don't have to make your object editable to do those things, which is absolutely massive. So I don't know if you want to dive into that. And uh, there, there's some really interesting workflows that I think people have been asking for for a long time that are now possible. Uh, with this new workflow so things like you know volume objects and coloring things differently using different materials on different parts of volume uh modeler objects so if you want to try that off yeah totally let's dive into that so uh you, you brought up really one of the best examples i think is is with volume objects i mean people have really really dug the whole volume modeling concept and of course mm -hmm. it's even better now with z remesher so you can make really oh, nice uh, finished meshes out of these things. But uh, basically, you can add a, a vertex color tag onto any object now. So right onto the volume mesher. I'm going to delete this one, and we'll start from scratch. And uh, I'm just going to search for vertex paint. And we'll add that vertex color. And then just go in and use fields. And so we'll start by setting a solid color. And we'll just set like a solid blue color. And then uh, we can go in and actually take individual objects that are feeding into the volume modeler and use them to recolor sections. Um, and usually this works best if you switch it into surface mode um, and you can drop the radius right down. And so you can see that we can go in and, you know, make specific aspects of a volume model, special colors just based on uh, based on uh the grab these sweeps here based on the the underlying geometry that's great so yeah this is a you know super cool functionality um, so at that point um now. yeah i forgot to mention that vertex colors are also a thing too because vertex colors if you're exporting to uh, different apps like I believe ZBrush or like Substance Painter. There's really a there's a huge use case to use vertex colors and to export those uh, out with your model. Um, and then I'm I'm guessing like 
what you would do in like Redshift or whatever is you would, there's like a vertex color node in which you could apply like different materials to each of those vertex colors as like masks, basically. Yeah, or you can just use the vertex color directly. Um, directly this yeah. was set up with the standard material, but we can go ahead and create a Redshift material. And all you do is add a vertex attribute node um, and drag this vertex map in there and feed that right into your color for instance, and scene wasn't set up for Redshift. So hopefully you kind of get the idea. <laughs> yeah, get the um, idea. We're not quite there yet, but, um, but, uh, but that's the yeah, idea that... there. Um, and one thing I did want to point out there, Rick, is if you could open up that Redshift material again. So yep. there used to be uh, in, in previous versions, uh, I think before the Redshift updated node editor, when it was still on that Espresso system, the node that you would use is the C4D vertex map node, I believe. But now everything is way more streamlined in that if you need to use any type of vertex information, whether that be vertex color or vertex map, the thing you're going to go to now in this new node system is not the C4D vertex map. It's now the vertex attribute. So same thing, just called something different, but the vertex attribute is just way more streamlined. So a little quick tip right. for anyone who might have like been looking for the C4D vertex map node and been like, where is it? And wondering if the vertex attribute was the same thing. It is. Uh, and there you go. Uh, the bonus yeah, of vertex attribute is that it uses the name and mm. so rather than a hard link. So if you apply the material to multiple objects and all of those objects have the same, have tags that are named the same, then mm. that material can apply to all of those objects. Gotcha. Yeah. And I think, I think I was watching a Thanasis tutorial on Cineversity and he mentioned about how with, you can now, you know, easily stack a bunch of these vertex maps too. And when you are doing that, it's important to name your vertex maps, different things just to, you know, for organization's sake as well, but then to designate different materials to different things like that. Um, while we were, I mean, we did mention uh, Expresso in the old Expresso system. Uh, oh, yeah. We we barely like covered most of this procedural stuff. So yeah, like show some more examples of. Ooh. Yeah, just one more fun one. You know, here we're we're applying a vertex map onto uh, a an object that's basically an extrude. And so this effect, we can still go and modify this text anytime. So we can do EJ. And we're able to keep everything completely parametric. Um, and of course, you're That's seeing crazy. some of the new soft body stuff in there too. Yeah, you're, you're burying we'll the lead later. here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, that, and that just is like a perfect example of, of being able to, like, I... I'm allergic to making things editable. <laughs> like, I, it's like think about how you would have to work in the past. Like, if you wanted to ever go back and do something like this, you'd have to make it. Uh, you'd have to make a copy of everything, and then use layers, and then hide those things. Like, you don't have to do that anymore. If all you need to do is work with vertex maps or do polygon selections, and I think this is such a huge uh, workflow uh, improvement here and quality of life thing that it's like it's going to be. Uh, incredible to see what people do to be able to create procedural setups like this. And, and really that's been the strength of cinema 4d all this time is keeping things editable client comes down as like, Hey, can you, can you do this? We change this and also make 50 versions of this thing. Like, boom, there you go. You can easily just swap things out without having to, you know, make 50 different things editable for all the different client requests or text requests that you need. Um, but yeah, so uh, in addition to vertex maps, just to reiterate, vertex colors, uh, selection tags, so polygon selections. Polygon you can selections. Store, yeah. You can store polygon selections uh, without making things editable. Can you also do edge selections in? Only game? polygon selections for Only now. Only polygons for right now. I mean, that's... Yeah, and, and it is a little bit with the like... selections, admittedly, it's a little bit tricky because you have to... With the selection tags, we don't have them in the tags menu, so you have to create one on an object and then copy it. Basically. Gotcha. I mean, I, that's uh, polygon selections are always the big thing I use with that anyways, to apply different materials and stuff like that. Um, uh -huh. 
and, and I, I did mention Espresso before, uh, there is a new way to kind of work and expose different uh, aspects of, say, an Espresso tag if you did. You, oh, yeah. Polygon this was selection the poly right selections. There. Yeah. And I mean, that's um, the yeah, the, the Espresso tag is, is another super cool uh, quality of life update. Um, and I'm not sure if I have a scene handy to show it, but let's just create a, an example really quick. Do some set driver, set driven, which is yeah. still to this day, if you don't know set driver, set driven, espresso uh, setup, you you should. And if this is your first introduction to this, who who hasn't learned of this? Who doesn't know what set driver, set driven is in the chat? If so, put like an emoji out. Uh, like a thumbs down emoji if you don't know it, thumbs up emoji if you do know it. Uh, but it's one of those things where it's like, oh man, if you don't know this, you should. So I don't know if you want to walk through what that is and then go into the espresso. Woo. Yeah. Okay. I guess we can start from scratch and I can, I can Sorry, explain I... <laughs> it. Uh, so set driver, set driven is basically if you want to take one attribute and you go into expressions and choose set driver. And then you go into another attribute and you say expression set driven. And it creates an espresso that's basically just mapping the one expression to the other. And so now when we go in and manipulate the X size of this cube, we're changing the Y size of the other. Um, all that's been in Cinema 4D forever. Yeah. But what we've added is you for a long time, you've had these hints where the keyframe dot is that this attribute is being driven or it's a driver. So the arrow to the right means it's a driver, and then this means that it's being driven. Um, but now what you can do is alt-click on that and actually see jump to the other attribute that's actually driving it. Um, and you can see that it selects that object and shows you that attribute. Or we can select the Espresso tag that's controlling that attribute. Or we can just open the Espresso editor and immediately start to edit the the expression that's driving that parameter. Um, so just a one of those little small things that actually a user specifically mentioned uh, to a yeah. programmer, and he just <laughs> went that night and did it, uh, which was really awesome. Um, and uh, well, don't I think it's don't go making people think there. that changes can happen in one night here, Rick. You're gonna get a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> every now every now and then we get lucky. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, people are, it looked like a lot of people in this chat didn't know about that set driver, set driven. Like, that's the basic, most basic form of espresso. It's not hard. It's very easy. Like, that's like if you're going to get your feet wet in espresso, that's a great uh, introduction there. And someone, uh, Carlo mentioned that uh, one thing I like to do as well is like actually connect the the name of the MoText object to whatever text is in the MoText field sure and so you could easily just change yeah so show that real quick for people that are not familiar so set driver so set driver and then go in here to the name and actually i think driven. it's the other way around right oh well if you want to drive it that way you want to drive it with uh, or you could do it either way, way yeah so yeah so I or you do it the other way around where you could like well. if you want to change the text the yeah yeah huge uh, yeah, so that's great. Espresso, uh, quality of life improvement. Um, speaking of other quality of life improvements, uh, tell me a little bit more about this, uh, watch folder. I feel like a uh, watch folder might be something someone not, uh, might not even know what that means. Like what is a watch folder? What does it do? Yeah. I, I hope people know what it means. Cause it's the reaction to the single largest piece of feedback that we uh, have, I think, have ever gotten, at least while I've been a product manager, um, which is that everyone loves the asset browser. They love the ability to easily access the Maxon capsules that we provide to be able to, you know, easily search. But they didn't like having to copy all of their files into a, a, a special database directory structure that we had set up for the assets. So watch folders basically allows you to link to any folder on your drive and uh, use it just like any other asset browser folder. So they're, they're index, you know, there's a cache, the index is cached. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as you're concerned, it's just uh, interacting just like any other asset browser. But if we were to open this, this folder, you see that it's just, it's not a, a custom 
uh, it's not a custom folder. It's just a normal folder. Just wherever it is on your desktop drive. or your, your um, hard drive. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see that we have easy access to all these HDRIs that I've downloaded. So um, the previews then, show up really great. We've also got this new option here, which I'm not sure if it's on by default. If it's not, it probably should be show content of subcategories. That allows you to just select the top level and it sort of collapses all of the oh, and see everything. The so oh, you can awesome. see everything. Um, so especially when you get down here, like into the redshift materials or any of the materials, it's nice to just be able to see everything without having to, to deal with the subfolders in a lot of cases. Yeah, that's great. Cause I, I, I know everyone, all, all three of the artists have all of their acquired, um, assets that they find from all over the place that you know 3d artists are hoarders <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> assets and textures and hdris and gobos and all that kind of stuff so it's great that people can start to use uh this kind of stuff because i like even previously to get something that nicely set up like as long as you have a nice folder structure and things are named right like in the past you would have to like to import all that organized, you'd have to do like the whole lib4d file setup and, and all that kind of stuff to get uh, to package assets nicely like that. So it's good to, to, right. not have to do that necessarily anymore. Yeah. And all of these, you can still add all of your keywords and everything to them. Um, and, and so, and uh, you can search for something like sunset, for instance. And uh, right now you're seeing them filtered by the type of asset they are. But we also added these search options so you can filter by the database. And here you can see my watch folder assets. And here you can see all the sunset assets that we provide in the Maxon Assets Library. Um, and the other thing I was going to point out is that we've added this auto watch option so that uh, in your scenes, any of the text folders, or you can set this to any relative path you want, will automatically be set up as a watch folder. So... You see, I have the shark folder, the shark scene open. And so it's mm -hmm. automatically created a, a watch folder for the assets in that shark scene. Um, this isn't a great example, but, you know, of course, if you were working on a big client project, you might have folders of assets that you're using all the time uh, as you're building out that client project. And so uh, it's really handy to just have a, that auto watch pop up when you're working specifically on that project. And that's that's like a project by project basis. You can set that stuff up. So it's not like any new project you set up. It's going to have all this stuff that you don't really need for a brand new project and stuff like that. So that's nice. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, the shark is set up right now. If I uncheck this, you see it doesn't show up over here anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. If I check it, it does. And if if, say, I have an assets folder instead of a text folder that I want to show, I can easily just, you know, type assets instead here. And I don't, but if I did, that's, mm -hmm. you know, you would, you would get it there. Um, and actually, you know, uh, we're going to dig into some questions here that we're getting from the, the live chat here. And yeah, just yeah. Uh, to reiterate that, uh, yeah, drop all your Q and a uh, drop all your questions in here, anything specific for anything we're talking about right now, we'll try to answer them as we're going through this. So uh, I believe Havana, I hope that's how you say your name. Sorry if it's not. Um, but they're asking if there's a way to migrate hand built collections of like materials uh, that are currently stored in a category in the asset browser in R25. Can you easily make those materials, ava uh, materials available for use in 2023? Yeah. So what you're going to want to do is uh, copy the database. It's, it's all in the database structure. Um, mm -hmm. And I think support should be able to help you with that. I don't have a good example here right handy to show, but um, basically you should be able to just copy the database um, from one to the other. Um, you may want to go in here to the databases view and show in Finder in order to find that database, and then you can copy it over to 2023. Gotcha. Uh we have a we have an interesting question from uh, Superfresh here. He's asking, uh, "Can you actually search by emoji? Can you throw emojis in certain?" Things? <laughs> like, I don't um, think you can name things emojis just quite yet on uh, on desktop. I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, you know we can go into the keywords here, and I don't know if this supports. I don't even know how to type an emoji. So I know. I mean, yeah. I guess we could just do 
you know, a smiley, smiley face. face. There you go. So all and your happiest, all that of your keep, assets that keyword. make you happy. And then you can have the ones that make you sad. And so then we can uh, search by. I think I did winky face. There we go. Oh, there there's go. more assets that make us happy. Even. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, can you, I mean, uh, I know that I feel like you guys are sneakily adding new assets to the asset browser every now and then. I think uh, I, I recently opened up the asset browser and saw that there's new like Redshift materials, which I'm super excited to see more of those come in. But it looks like we have like more Redshift specific uh, assets in there as well. Yeah. So uh, lately there's been an emphasis on doing interiors. So we put a whole bunch of coffee tables out. Uh, but yeah, just shortly, just not that long ago, we put out a, a set of Redshift materials, uh, which if I turn on that show content and subcategories, we can see all of them. Um, and uh, yeah, these are constant. We're constantly adding to the the assets that we're providing uh, through the Maxon library. The beautiful thing about the asset browser is that we can we can push those and deliver them to subscribers at any time. Gotcha. Yeah, people are uh, asking about some Dingbat support to search in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, me personally, I'm hoping that I see a couple cloth fabrics uh, in there. And uh, I know with all the new cloth dynamics and stuff, which we'll uh, be getting to very shortly here, I, I, I feel like people are going to find those type of assets very, very useful. Rope yep. textures as well. Um, yeah, awesome. Uh, Definitely. I think the last thing we'll cover as far as the quality of life stuff is, you know, ZBrush is now part of Max on one. So the integration between those two apps is constantly being developed. One of the things you already mentioned, the zero measure, holy crap. Is that like a, that is just Amazing. wizardry. If you don't know about the zero measure that was added, uh, was that in 26? Uh, it was in 26. Yes. 26. Yeah, it's it is absolute wizardry and uh, just the amount of workflows you can use that with is is, is incredible. Um, but yeah, there's there's a I think there's an update to the GoZ uh, bridge where you can kind of work with ZBrush files more easily with C4D. Yeah. So anytime you want to bring a ZBrush file into C4D, the first thing you need to do and you only need to do this once is to go down here and choose GoZ install. And that just uh, updates the files. This won't be necessary in the future, but until we get uh, the next ZBrush release, that that updates the GoZ files in order to uh, know how to work them with Cinema 4D. And then we just hit GoZ visible and wait a second. And when we get into Cinema 4D, we'll see that entire uh, object brought over. I think <laughs> I'm going to end up with two of them now because I'm impatient. Uh, and the thing I didn't remember to do is to switch to Redshift. Uh, so uh, one of the great enhancements here now is that uh, we are using, uh, we're detecting what renderer is being used and we're adapting the Gozi import based on the active renderer. Um, let me just try quitting ZBrush and restarting just to see. Oh, there. It just did it. There it did. I, I am impatient. We established <laughs> that. Okay. Uh, so uh, what we're doing now is we're doing edge creasing. We're doing the subdivision surfaces. Uh, we've got this new polygroup tag so that you can easily choose the polygroups that you set up in ZBrush. And you can select from polygroups. Um, so you can select a poly group and it'll show up there. Yeah. And the poly groups is, is basically, that's like very specific to a ZBrush workflow, right? Right. Um, okay. but the really cool thing is that it's set up all of the vertex maps so that it's ready to just immediately render in, re in Redshift. Uh, you oh, see, wow. we got all of the right materials here and all of the vertex attribute tags that we just talked about come over from ZBrush with all the paint and mm -hmm. uh, it's right there ready to go. Yeah, I mean, we we actually just did a ZBrush tutorial with the amazing Anna Carolina, who 
if you don't know, she just recently did a, uh, I think, a NAB presentation just this year. Um, and she she showed that workflow. And I think it was like, it was only usable to sh use like in the, the standard material. And then you would have to just do that extra step of converting to Redshift. Um, but now this is great that it just automatically, you don't, it just skips that step. It's already set up for you in the, uh, in Redshift and already makes all the separate materials as well. So it's not like one vertex color map and one material. Uh, this is really great. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, awesome enhancements there to go Z. And of course we'll be continuing to work to bring technology across from C4D into ZBrush, ZBrush into C4D, and, uh, of course, improve the integration between them. Yeah, I need to I need to get on learning ZBrush. Just add it to the list of things that I have to learn. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, speaking of Redshift, let's kind of switch gears over into Redshift improvements, and yet again with like the amazing uh, quality of life improvements, stacked materials. Oh my goodness, that is a game changer right there. Because I know anyone who's taken Cinema 4D Ascent, it was like a whole process to do decals and stuff like that you had to do the specific nodes and you would always have to add your decals to the same material now mm -hmm. you can basically just use the workflow that you use with the standard renderer where you can stack materials uh, and do that in redshift as well which is huge yeah and this has always been one of my favorite features of cinema 4d is how easy it is to to move your textures around and and stack them and do decal mapping workflows and so uh, I'm super excited to have stack materials in, in Redshift. And of course, you can just render and, and there's your material. And in fact, if you're using the viewport IPR, you can even manipulate it while you're rendering. It's live. Yeah. So, you, I mean, like imagine you had to stack 18 materials in the past. That would be such a pain. Yep. Now you could just do as many as you want live in the viewport, just like you did. I think uh, there is a, there is a limit. I think there is a limit of like six right now. Um, six stack material? Do six. Yeah. Okay. So that's like, is, is that a limitation that might be getting worked on a little bit? It's something that we could probably, if there's a lot of user feedback that they need more than six, we could probably adjust that. All right. Let's see. Yeah. Let's see how many, how many uh, materials you need to stack. Uh, in, your, in your workflows here. Um, yeah, but I mean, it, it, if you do need six, then that's just the point where you just combine multiple decals together and then, you know, work with that. Um, ooh, another great thing. Uh, and another thing, like if you're, I feel like we probably have like a lot of people that might be new to third-party rendering and like just new to the the joys that is working with things like subsurface scattering and those similar render intensive uh, uh, render features. Uh, one of the big things that I know, like Chad Ashley and, and a lot of people that are really excited about uh, is the random walk subsurface scattering. So mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of people might be familiar with subsurface scattering, but a lot of people might not know what the heck a random walk Subsurface scattering is that just when you you drink too many beers at Camp MoGraph and you're randomly <laughs> walking all over the place while doing subsurface scattering? Like what is what is all that? That's exactly what it does. What it is. <laughs> um, There's a lot of that no, uh, going on. Last so week. here you can see the result of of subsurface scattering with random walk. If I just switch to ray trace diffusion, what you're going to see is that we lose so much of the surface detail. Mm. Um, and so what random walk gets us is just so much more surface detail in our object uh, while getting still beautiful subsurface scattering. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a huge night and day difference. Yeah. And this this goes along with uh, because I think we, we didn't even mention the fact that the whole subsurface scattering interface is completely different. Like it's more uh, more streamlined as well. We updated it all in, as part of the standard surface. So that was mm -hmm. came out with 26 in uh, April. Um, mm -hmm. But then we were able to and, and you know, we we did that in preparation for random walk. And then uh, we were able to add random walk in June or July. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember trying to explain what uh, it was a dielectric. And then there was another version. There's two versions of yeah. subsurface <laughs> scattering you choose. And one was like 
you had to choose the opposite color on the color wheel to get that color showing up. And now it's just way more uh, streamlined as far as like, what is the color of the subsurface scattering you want? That's that color. Yeah. And then the radius is, okay, what color do you want to show up as the light penetrates into your object? And that's the mm -hmm. radius color right there. Um and then I believe that the scale, that's basically how far in the light's penetrating. Is that based on like centimeters there? Uh, it's in scene units and it kind of relates to the radius as well. So mm -hmm. um, it's, 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 a little, it's still a little bit of like a visual process, I think. Um, gotcha. So it's not yeah. like exact like centimeter units or anything like that. It's just like a, a, more like a well, based on the actual scene unit. It also depends on, and I, and I don't remember exactly how it depends on, but it depends on your setting that you've got set here in the Redshift mm -hmm. render settings, whether you're using the legacy units or the scene units. Um, oh. That completely changes the, the units that it's, how the units are interpreted. Oh, I didn't even know that that was a thing. I'm always dive <laughs> into the systems. Because I don't think I, I go into the system very much at all. Um, well, everybody that, with a Mac has to go there because it warns you constantly that you need to be using 256 or 512 because you've got a lot of RAM. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, wow. So yeah. if you have more RAM, you can use the bigger bucket size. Bigger buckets, yeah. Oh, interesting. Is that a PC thing yet or is that mainly a Mac just because they go over board? It shows them? up a lot on the M1, I think, just because they have the unified memory architecture. So they have a lot of RAM. Oh, interesting. I did not know that. Mac, yeah. look at that. Making making things uh really fast and rendering things fast. Um, let's see. Oh, let's talk about VDBs because that's uh, yet another Redshift uh, update here as well. Uh -huh. Um, so volumetric anisotropy. That's a that's a ten point vocab word right there. <laughs> yeah, um, I still can't I still can't figure out how to pronounce that properly. Anisotropy. Is it aniso, anisotropy? And I, I I think it's anisotropy or anisotropy. And isotropy. I don't know. You know, we uh, finally figured out how to say bokeh, and now it's that we got this other thing to yeah try to figure out. Um, yeah, so I don't have a good example for that, but basically, if you look at you know some of our uh, website examples, it's basically like when uh, light is scattering through the volume, like if you imagine clouds, and uh, by default we didn't the and the anisotropic effect wasn't there, so that uh, the clouds would just appear dark. But now the anisotropy is there, so that the light scatters through the clouds more pleasant i mean that <laughs> i mean that it's the same basic uh base the same basic uh theory behind the uh, anis anisotropy i forgot how you said it but basically the same <laughs> thing in, in subsurface here where depending on how like i think if you have the slider down that means that you're going to see more of the like light rays penetrate towards the uh, camera versus away if you crank up the the value yeah yeah so same thing like think of that happening on a bunch of like volumetric clouds right uh, and you have that same control Anis anisotropy anistrophy <laughs> anistrophy yeah, everyone's trying their best to do it in the chat as well <laughs> <laughs> pronounce it <laughs> um <laughs> tomato tomato am i right uh let's see there we go uh, forward and back scatter thank you <laughs> forward and back scatter. yeah thanks okay. james <laughs> <laughs> we'll just call it that yeah yeah so yeah closer to the camera more further away from the cameras where lights penetrating um uh, let's let's talk a little bit about the redshift cpu for those of you that uh might not be up on that but uh was it 26 where redshift cpu is at or was that a previous version i can't it was in remember. 26 in 26 so yep. that that kind of did away with the whole like you have to have a specific nvidia card or whatever amd card to be able to use redshift gpu here yep. you can basically just use your cpu and no matter what computer you're on you can you can basically use redshift within reason probably want a relatively newer computer to run a lot of these third-party renderers um but I mean, that that was one of the biggest barriers to people learning Redshift is they had like a, a Mac that 
they had an AMD card and they couldn't quite uh, dive into Redshift. And the CPU version just totally does away with that. So I think, uh, yeah, the, if you want to dive into some of the CPU updates that you got in uh, 2023. There weren't a whole lot of updates to the CPU in 2023. We're making incremental improvements to performance, um, but there really aren't any feature updates to do because it's it's 100% feature complete. Like one to one with. ZP, yeah, I mean, right? I guess there was one minor change, which was we now support round co round corners on CPU, which was just round a, corners. Yeah, it was a licensing thing that we had to sort out, so it wasn't there for the first release, but now it is. Um, so yeah, the, the beautiful thing about CPU is it renders exactly the same as GPU. Um, awesome. it doesn't render as fast, uh, because you know, the GPUs offer incredible performance. Uh, mm -hmm. but it, like you said, it's, it's a least common denominator where, you know, everybody on every system has access to it and every cinema 4d user has access to it. Uh, cause there's no additional license required. Yeah, I think that's the most important thing where if you it's not like if you learn how to use Redshift CPU that you have to learn a completely new system for the GPU version. No, if you, you learn one, if you get a computer that that can take advantage of the CPU uh, and you get that license, then you could you just totally hit the ground running. And it's just much faster because you can take advantage of all those new uh, GPU cards, including they just announced today the, the 4090. So that's, that's going to be really awesome to see yeah. what improvements we have there as, as well. Um, Super exciting. Yeah. So let's uh, maybe talk about uh, just to, just to appease the chat Ashley's uh, of the world <laughs> that are obsessed with aces. Um, I know where we're going. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, open color IO aces. Can you like explain that to me as if I was five years old? Like, do the Michael Scott for that? <laughs> explain that um, I, me like I'm, I'm still five. looking for the people who can explain it to me, but I know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's I'll, so I'll give it a shot. To... Yeah. Um, so, basically, the idea behind Open Color IO is that it creates a unified framework for color. Uh, and that's uh, not necessarily ASUS, but ASUS is one of the more popular color spaces that's enabled through having open color IO. So you can use open color IO and still work scene linear like you've always done in, in cinema 4d. You won't really see any difference because it's basically scene linear. Uh, but uh, if you use ACES, what you're going to benefit from is a couple of things. The ACES render space has a wider gamut than, uh, than the sRGB color space. And then there's a, a display space or a tone mapper that's applied at the end of the process that applies a really nice highlight roll off that's very similar to what you would expect from, you know, film, you know, uh, capture. Mm -hmm. And basically, does that take care of the, because I remember it would trip some people up when you go to render in Redshift initially when you would render it it would look kind of like the colors were all washed out and light and then like one that once that frame was done in the redshift picture view it would then apply it would like pop a lot yeah then, yeah right and that's because the picture viewer didn't support uh open color IO or asus yet but now it does so, so that your, removes your that results whole are gonna thing. match yeah nice so i knew um, that would trip people up is they would see those first few buckets go and be like wait a minute that's that's not the colors I thought. So that's, that's great. That that's like a one-to-one -one now. Yeah. So this is, I mean, if without ACES, the, these blue and red highlights would be completely washed out, but you can see mm -hmm. that you get kind of a nice fall off there uh, now, thanks to ACES. And is that something that I, I know, is that something that's on by default or is there a specific thing you have to change in your project file? Cause I saw you <laughs> doing, uh, doing something there in the, uh, uh, preferences i believe so uh when you're in your project settings by default you're still going to be in basic color mode which means nothing changes okay uh, so that's that so washed out color yeah if you want to use open color io you switch this and you choose open color io by default when you switch into open color io it's going to use asus uh, so we have a preset here, so you can choose ASUS or sRGB. sRGB you see is going to set scene linear sRGB. ASUS is going to set ASUS and an ASUS tone map mapper. Okay. And now we got, uh, looks like we got a pretty good question. I, and like I said, I don't know 
<laughs> much about all this color thing other than like hey uh when i render something now it, it looks consistent but joel is asking uh what happens if you create colors that are outside of the srgb gamut well that's uh we've actually updated the color picker so that um when you're in open color io mode you have options here to choose in srgb which is going to kind of limit what you can actually choose to the srgb gamut Mm -hmm. uh, as it maps to ASUS, you can mm -hmm. choose in render space. So you're actually choosing in the ASUS CG gamut It'd be, when you've got ASUS as your render space. Uh, you can do raw or you can do display space, which this one is basically doing an inverse color transform. So it's saying that you're going to tone map this in ASUS. I'm going to let you pick a color. I'm going to invert that from the color you picked based on the ASUS color and set that as the color so that when it goes back through the tone mapper it's going to be close to the same color you it's a lossy process going through the tone mapper so it's not 100 percent. but this is the mode that you want to use if you're trying to match a brand color or something like that yeah i actually saw a really great uh very short tutorial from i think chad ashley from gsg about that display mode where you're trying to like if you ever send something a render to a client and they're like that's uh that yellow is slightly off that's one of the ways to get the exact colors you want color pick that color chip and and get the ground running um well and and of course another way to get the color you want is that we have magic bullet looks included with cinema 4d um and it's fully aware of open color io now and if you're in Magic Bullet Looks, you can use the color remap option. And so if you need this red here to be a specific red, you just choose that red. And then you go in here and, and tweak it to the specific color you need it to be. And then you can keep adding remappers. And I'm messing this up, but you get the idea. You can keep adding remappers in order to... Uh, in order to define exactly what colors should sort of bend into what color. Um, and so, and you can see that we've made this so that it it's aware that you're working in ASUS CG space. And then of okay. course in here, you can also add other great tools like the, uh, the diffusion that's new in magic bullet looks. So this optical diffusion creates a really nice bloom effect. Oh, nice. Um, and then you just hit the check mark and you're back in the picture viewer with the effect applied. And in fact, it's applied as a separate layer. So you can go back to the original if you'd like. Now, if you want to render that with, uh, or if you want to save that image with that baked in, is that something you can do right in the picture viewer there? Just file export or? Yeah. When you choose save, it will save Super with jet. that. Okay, in, great. Baked in, yeah. And if you want to bake in the view transform, there's an option there to do that as well. Okay. And what is the view transform? Is that basically that whole shift that we were just talking about before where uh, you'd have the washed out colors and then it would correct it? The view transform is how it converts from render space into display space. Okay. And basically it's applying a tone mapper in that process is my understanding. Gotcha. Um, okay. I, you yeah, know, I like Chad can these... have the after show and explain all <laughs> yeah, the things yeah. I got wrong. I um, know. I feel like there's all these new color space things that like view transform. I'm like, I don't, I'm not familiar with that. Usually I'm just like, if you're an after effects user, like you just know when you render something out, it's that's what it looks like. So these are all new concepts well, for the three D users. And that's part of the reason why we didn't turn it on by default is because we know people are going to need some time to get used to these concepts. Uh, for some people, basic mode might be perfectly fine and they can stick with that for a while. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, this is a mode for color nerds who kind of know yep. what they want to get out of it, I think. Yeah. But I mean, it, just watching some of the stuff that, I've seen about aces and stuff like that. Just the images look way more realistic. And like you said, the things that would normally be blown out are not. So uh, great that that is, is added in there. Uh, and, and everyone can kind of learn more about on their own uh, or ask Chad Ashley. 
<laughs> all right, let's go to uh, personally one of my favorite new features that have uh, been kind of coming down the pike since. I mean, we can even talk about since, uh, you know, is it R25 where the dynamic placement tool kind of came in where you got a sneak peek at like the new dynamic or the new simulation features where in R26 we had new cloth added where if, if you want to check out uh, some of the presentations that were done at this most recent Seagraph, I, I did two presentations on the new cloth and NASA's did as well. And I believe at IBC, uh, Thanos, uh, motion punk, he did a presentation on that, which I think should hopefully be out here in the next week or so. But so soft bodies is the new hotness that just came out in 2023. And, uh, I started this whole trend of asking people if it was, uh, vellum or C4D cloth or C4D simulation. And I tell you <laughs> what, people are getting very confused, which I think says loads about the new uh, C4D simulation systems that uh, you you can get these amazingly beautiful simulations and cloth simulations and now soft bodies and it like it is jaw droppingly fast in your viewport. Uh, I've I've seen a lot of people. And I've, I've posted some uh, Twitter links here that we'll post in the chat here, too, of some of the things people have been. Uh, yeah, there it is. So there's my cloth simulation where it looks like it looks like water. Like that is incredible. It literally took me like, you know, 20 minutes to set up and to bake that sim. The cash that sim took like a minute. And those are like I maxed out the plane object uh the the sub uh the, the width and height segments which i think the max is like is it 500 by 500 or something like that or 200 by 200 whatever it is i maxed it out so that's a dense mesh and like this was running in my viewport for those of you who have used cloth or soft bodies in the past like to do something like this in an old version you'd have polygons exploding out you'd probably crash your scene uh one awesome thing is that if it if you do have a simulation that is super dense and and there would be errors it would freeze your system you get an, uh, a message a, a dialog box that says like hey you're you're doing a pretty hefty simulation are you sure you want to do that and you can like cancel out of it in case you put in a wrong number accidentally somewhere um but yeah i mean i i'm now i'm just like professing my absolute love <laughs> of uh, all this stuff but yeah if you want to tab over to i go by zach there yeah so uh if you're not following, I go by Zach, definitely follow him. He's doing some really cool uh, cloth experiments. This is using uh, the new soft bodies and some of the new features that come along with uh, soft bodies, the mix animation and stuff like that. And using vertex maps to, to drive uh, soft body stuff. Uh, and then the last one here is uh, Thanos again, where, uh, like I mentioned before, IBC, he did a presentation like, look at this. That is like, how many plane objects is that along with the rope simulation? And I think this is, this is one of those things where as you start, I feel like once we, we start having all these very, very talented artists that can make things way more beautiful than like me and, 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 and nose man, uh, you're going to, you're going to, I've just seen so many people just, I mean, you can see how many likes these tweets are getting and just how many mind blown emojis and stuff like that. So I think it's, people are just starting to realize like this, the power of what has been added even back in April, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, so just, to, just to bring everything around cloth's been there. Cloth has been there since uh, 26, which was out in April. The one thing that has been added is, is the new soft bodies, which it's all in the same tag. Now uh, soft bodies, are just as fast as uh, the new uh, cloth system. Again, they're all using uh, the same particle based uh, simulation system, right? Yes. So uh, we had the cloth in 26. Uh, one of the immediate pieces of feedback we got was that people wanted it to work with field forces. And so we added field force support in 26 one in June, along with some other enhancements uh, like improving the collisions. And then, um, you know, the great thing is in 2023, not only did we extend it with an additional simulation type with soft bodies, but we continued to improve the underlying system. So now we've added the option to uh, 
do the mix animation. So you can really go in and art direct what you're doing. We've added the stickiness option. Um, so some really cool stuff uh, that, uh, you know, we continue to build into the simulation system, uh, both adding additional simulation types and giving you more capabilities in the ones that, that you've got. Yeah, I feel like with a lot of these updates, like I feel like even when Field was introduced, like it took a good amount of time for people yeah. to like start using it and start. I feel like even now to this day, like I don't think we've seen uh, like we haven't scratched the surface of what Fields can do. And now with, you know, the the uh, the parametric ability to add vertex maps to say subsurface scatter or, or a subdivision surface or, you know, any generator object. Like, I think you're going to start to see a lot more people play around with that. And same thing with like the soft body. Like one of my thing is like, I'm, I, I, and I've seen people already do this is they take like a uh, Intagma tutorials that they do it in Houdini and they like, Oh, I can, let me see if I can make that in cinema 4d. And I guarantee you're probably going to be able to, and probably with a fraction of the complexity too, which is, uh, uh, one of the coolest parts as well. Um, but as far as simulation stuff, I know you don't have any, do you have any scenes for that or? Yeah. Yeah. We can oh, okay, show awesome. a couple of quick yeah. scenes. Yeah. Show a couple of things. Cause there's like some main like headliner uh, things with the, the new. Uh, so let's just look at the, uh, at the soft body. So I'm going to start by making the disc a collider and we'll turn uh, the elephant into a soft body. And what you see here is that, you get all of these red lines inside of the elephant. Um, and this is not ricochet. This is, <laughs> uh, this is actually uh, us creating internal struts or poles that connect from one side of the mesh to the other. Um, and so these are providing internal structure to the object. Um, so with just that number of poles, what you're going to see is, yeah, we've got you know a fair amount of rigidity. Uh, but what we can do is actually go in and, and add more poles. We can adjust the spread of the poles and you can see how that's, uh, giving, uh, more direction, you know, that's filling the space more. Um, you know, we can adjust the softness of those poles. Uh, you can even use fields and, and adjust the directionality of the poles. Um, but so these are almost like internal stilts to some extent right. where you have a relationship from one point to the other on the, on those yeah. poles. And, and you can also choose to have those poles right now. They're just internal to the object, but you can choose both. And what that's doing is it's going to help the object, keep its structure, keep the relationship between elements of the object. So the legs will try mm. to stay the same distance apart, for instance. Okay. Yeah, so there, I mean, there's just so much more art direct ability in this uh, new soft body system, it seems like, with the ability of field. And then, you know, we're not even, we, we won't probably even have time to get into like the whole vertex maps thing. But I, I did a quick test where, you know, because there is this uh, new mix animation in here as well, where you can kind of control whether, you know, what parts of your object using fields are, are, are having a, soft body is attached or uh, affecting it. Oh no, all these poor T-Rexes. So we got all of these T-Rexes. Oh, that's an emitter. These are getting emitted. Yeah, they're getting emitted. That's awesome. So and I believe, like... okay, yeah, so we're just following shape. But we've also added these these follow animation functions. So, you know, a lot of the things that people have loved from Bullet uh, with follow animation, we now have more powerful options with mix animation. Mm -hmm. So we've got this option to follow animation with force, which puts more of a transition between, like, pins is going to pull them directly to the space, but mm -hmm. force is going to actually allow them to sort of transition from their state into the animated state. Uh, so, uh, and of course, all of these can be controlled with vertex maps that can be applied on procedural objects now. 
Yeah, and that's the great thing too. The procedural objects. Uh, yeah, I see you got to connect there to have all the the spheres interact with one another. Uh, yeah, I'm so happy to you know we're we're cut, we're starting to see like a full picture of what this new dynamic system is is turning into. I think the only outstanding piece is just the rigid body, which again you can see. I feel like you can see a little bit of that preview with the dynamic placement tools and all that kind of stuff, but. Uh, just the ability to, ooh, and then we got the stickiness here. And then here's the stickiness. Yeah, the the uh, the rigid bodies is something that you can kind of do now just by adding enough poles into the object right? Uh, with the soft bodies. But, uh, you know, as you've seen, we've been swiftly adding more simulation types uh, yeah. into this system. Yeah, pretty much outdating all of the soft body tutorials that have ever been done. So I'm, I'm excited to like job security. Back in. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. I'm excited to dive back in and like redo all of those techniques and all the new possibilities that are out there as well. Like, um, yeah, that this is particle based and uh, G GPU based as well. Like in theory, hopefully, you know, everything is going to get uh, much faster and faster just because of that GPU uh ability to drive everything like that just the just the things you can do inside the viewport i've shown some people uh just like viewport like just playing stuff in the viewport and people are just like blown away by the speed in which uh things play Ooh, oh so that's using vertex maps to control bendiness yeah so the vertex map is actually controlling the target length Oh, target uh, length. The, so that's something that has been added recently. Right. Uh, so you have the ability to adjust the target length and actually control that with a vertex map. And have everything clump up. Yeah, yep. this is that that was that missing piece where I think a lot of the, the things I've done and, and a lot of techniques that other artists have used in the past relied on that target length and having inflation and deflation. Uh, that that was the missing link there and to be able to control with vertex maps and again since vertex maps are parametric now it just adds this whole new way to work with uh soft bodies as well as uh any type of object inside of cinema 4d without making things editable um yep yeah incredible uh let's see here i'm just seeing if there's any questions here, but we'll, we'll, we'll blow through some, uh, some of the other stuff here, but yeah, we're going to be probably wrapping up here pretty soon. Cause I know Rick, you've been, uh, you've been <laughs> a, a trooper coming through here. I know you're a little bit on the weather, so I don't want to keep you longer. Almost uh, out of cough to... drops. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, if anyone has any final questions while we cover some of the, uh, last updates, there's just so many updates to get through. Uh, but yeah, let's talk about uh, Forger uh, and then Magic Bullet, and then we'll wrap up with uh, Moves by Maxon because all three products have also been updated in 2023. Yeah, so Forger is really exciting because what we've been able to do is actually take Cinema 4D's modeling core, all of the functions that you know and love from Cinema 4D, and put them on the iPad. Uh, so, uh, I, for those of you who haven't played with it yet, I really encourage you to download and play with it. There's a freemium version, um, or if you're max on one subscriber, you have access, uh, you know, drop it on your iPad and you can actually sit there on your couch and use all of the same cinema 4d modeling tools you're used to extrude, extrude enter. Uh, I guess we call it inset now, uh, fit circle, you know, are, are all there and you can, you can sit there and model directly on the iPad. And then of course there's, you know, feature, there's a command to send all of that, uh, modeling or the sculpting you do in Forger directly to Cinema 4D. Is that exported at, can you actually export a C4D file from Forger? Is it, uh, well, it's a live yeah. connection or not a live Ooh. connection, but basically it's a, it's a push. So you just, mm -hmm. uh, you hit a button in Forger to say, send to cinema 4d and it shows up in your cinema 4d. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's all like through the max on one app behind the scenes or something like that. It's just using, you know, the, the glory of the internet. <laughs> okay. wow. I've heard of the internet. Before. Bonjour and stuff like that. Uh, okay. So it's all cool. it's all local. It doesn't go actually up to the 
up to the cloud. It's just uh, it's just direct connection between the iPad and the and the desktop. That's awesome. Uh, Francisco, who good to see him. I saw him at camp. Uh, he said he's been using Forger on his flights this week uh, to Camp MoGraph. Awesome. Uh, so, I mean, that's that's like the incredible thing is like you can like I know when I'm done with my work day, the last thing I want to do is be on my office in front of my monitors. But there's just something about like if I'm on my iPad and I got my Apple Pencil, yep. like it's, it's more play. I don't know what it is. It's like something psychological, but it's amazing to be able to you know, do modeling on, on just an iPad. It's, it's, it's a uh, pretty incredible. Um, I, was, I heard that a bunch of people were playing with Max on moves at, at camp as well, which yeah. uh, unfortunately I wasn't able to join camp MoGraph this year, but uh, I heard some interest in Max on moves, which is great. We just redesigned yeah. the whole interface for it. Uh, for those who don't know, it allows you to uh, use your iPhone to capture facial animation or to capture uh, body movement. Um, it creates a rig and, and uses AI to determine the, uh, the animation of the rig. And then also, uh, the option to, uh, capture objects. So that functionality is a little bit different. What it like does is that, yeah, it helps you to take the pictures on your iPhone and then you send those pictures to cinema 4d. It does have to be on a Mac cause it's using a Mac API. But it uses that new Mac photogrammetry API that we we were featured in the keynote for. It sends all those images up to you know to to the Mac API and gets you an object back, and it's really really nice results. Um, so yeah, definitely check out Max on Moves. Uh, actually, we we actually have one of the artists that I was just we were just showing his work. Uh, I go by Zach. Uh, Zach asked if there's any plans for. Uh, Forger on Android, and I guess this is where we can also talk about. You you mentioned that Max on Moves is only on iOS right now, and I believe that's. The, I didn't know that Forger was also the same only iOS for yeah. right now. Or okay, so Max on Moves is actually very heavily tied into Apple APIs. The facial capture is, and the the rig capture are just things that Apple provides through AR Kit. The photogrammetry is something that Apple's providing through. Uh, reality kit. So uh, that's it's fairly locked into the iOS ecosystem because of that. Forger is a little less so, but I mean, Apple Pencil. I mean, iPads and Apple Pencil like Dude, are such a beautiful you. combination. And yeah. it's something that I don't, I haven't seen a really good alternative on Android for yet. So, uh, you know, I think that. Uh, you know, clearly there's a huge market on iPad and, you know, that's where our focus is right now. Yeah. So Whit Winbush saying that it needs to work on PC. He's got, I know he's got an iPad, so it looks like that's just where it's got to be. And actually it's, it's one of these things where it's like, it's, it's the fact that to be honest, like everything in an iPhone, like, or an iPad, like there's a reason why everything's more expensive than like an Android thing, because just the the quality and the speed in which the processing is, is uh, happening. And then just the, the investments and in, uh, that Apple is putting into all this AR VR stuff. I've heard rumors that maybe there's a, there's going to be a, a, you know, how they had Google glasses, like you'll probably have like Apple glasses. People have said it's by the end of the year. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it's been, I've seen a lot of the, uh, advancements and all that tech happening on Apple versus like Android, like even Adobe's Arrow, I think is only on iOS as well. So it's, it's one of those things where it's like, I don't think you want to complain to Max on, you want to complain to Android to like <laughs> get that capability in, in those systems. Um, yeah. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of benefit that Apple has from having a closed ecosystem as much as sometimes I don't like that closed ecosystem. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of benefit to it and they just have a huge market. So it, mm -hmm. it, it helps with, with that. Yeah. Uh, Winbush does mention that uh, Wacom Wacom uh, does make a pen for Android too. So oh, really there is that, I, I think that. which I haven't messed around with, but that's, that's awesome. Um, let's see here. So yeah, uh, I think the only thing we didn't cover is Magic Bull. If you want to 
quickly go over magic bullet improvements. I know you showed a little well, bit. We about kind, yeah, we kind of did cover that. Yeah. The main the cool. main enhancement to magic bullet was that we looped in all of the enhancements that came in April, the optical diffusion and the hoation, uh, mm -hmm. into the version that comes with Cinema 4D. And then also we made it uh, open color IO aware so that it can uh, it can interact with Cinema 4D in open color IO mode. Okay, uh, just two last questions. One is a fun one. Uh, so Francisco asked, "Well, uh, School of Motion alumni, good to see him. Um, is there training on the new cloth soft body stuff on Cineversity now? I know if there's not, Thanasis has been." kind of i know he's been behind the scenes making a lot of stuff so yeah I, I i don't know to be honest if there is yet but i'm sure that the nasus will have some up there soon um i i heard last week that the training team is working feverishly on on updated training content so uh so look for that and uh you know some other great enhancements on cineversity soon yeah, I know, you know, on Cineversity, the Maxon training team, uh, YouTube, like you guys are live <laughs> like three times a week, I feel like with all these uh, live streams. And I, I know right every now day at this point, <laughs> yeah, every every weekday, at least. <laughs> and I know right now you all are doing a, uh, a 3D cinematography with Chad Perkins, I believe. Uh I, you know, I can't even keep up with all of them. Okay. Well, I, 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 saw, <laughs> I saw him at camp and I was, I was watching a little bit of the cinematography stuff on the, uh, on the, uh, on the flight over to Camp Mograph. And it's just like incredible amounts of knowledge being uh, shared over there. Uh, yeah. So definitely check them out. Um, and then one last question we got from uh, your own colleague, Michael, who asked, what's your personal favorite new feature in C4D? It would be the procedural vertex maps. It just enables yeah. so much of the procedural workflows that Cinema 4D users love. Uh, you know, being able to keep everything live all the time is so powerful. Uh, and, and, you know, like you mentioned, it's clients come in with changes all the time. So mm -hmm. the, the more you can keep those things live, the more you can react to those changes without redoing everything. So uh, it's definitely that. Awesome. So is there, is there anything else, anything exciting happening at Maxon that you want to tease or talk about? Oh, there's always exciting things happening at Maxon. Uh, we have 3D motion shows continuing through the end of the year. Uh, we're going to be uh, at Adobe Max and NAB New York next month. Uh, so definitely look for us in all of those places. And then, as you mentioned, the training team is live every day, just about. Yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> So definitely join those webinars. Uh, great stuff uh, all the time. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you again so much for uh, coming on here and, and, and under the weather. Uh, <laughs> at that. Uh, you did an amazing job. Um, and just to plug some stuff we're doing over here at School of Motion, uh, of course, we have our C4D classes here where uh, you know, it's intense 12 week programs to learn cinema 4d. So if you are watching this stream, you're like, wow, I need to learn cinema 4d or you already know some cinema 4d, but you want to learn more about all those next level concepts. So like, you know, character animation, redshift, uh, rigging and, uh, uh, dynamics and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we have two classes that, that cover just those topics. So we have cinema 4d base camp which is that intro level Cinema 4D course where if you're completely brand new to Cinema 4D or 3D, uh, this is gonna get you up and running to working on full blown 3D projects and allowing you to work on 3D for clients and add that to your tool set. And then if you already have some 3D skills, you wanna learn more techniques and of course the third party renders and all the stuff that we've been kind of talking here today, uh, definitely check out Cinema 4D Ascent where uh, both of these courses are taught by me. So if you aren't sick of me yet, uh, yeah, definitely check those two courses out. Uh, and if you are an advanced user and all this stuff is like, oh man, this is, I already know all this stuff. And you do want to learn those cinematography concepts, where I, which I was just talking about uh, just a little bit ago. Uh, 3D cinematography, cinematography concepts are some of the most important aspects of becoming an amazing 3D artist. 
and our course lights camera render with the impeccable David area who teaches this class. Uh, it is going to take your 3D skills to the limit and it's going to teach you all those important concepts like composition, camera moves, lighting, like all the things that are the most important aspects of getting your 3D render to look amazing is taught in this course. And just so everyone knows, LCR is not going to be available after this fall in its current form. And that's all we'll say about that for right now. So if you've been wanting to take LCR uh, with TA support and, and get your 3D skills to that next level, definitely take uh, that course this fall. Speaking of the fall session, it begins October 10th. Registration's open right now. So if you want to take one of uh, our 3D courses or any of our courses, uh, definitely uh, now is the time to uh, sign up. And if you have any questions about any of our courses, definitely reach out to support, reach out to me, reach out to anyone. Don't reach out to Rick because he doesn't know much about our courses. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we're, we're always here. You can even schedule a call with one of our uh, support staff here at School of Motion, our, camp, our course counselors, almost a camp counselor. It's got that camp MoGraph brain. Uh, so if you do need to ask any specific questions, we're here to get all those questions answered and we're excited to see everyone in this next uh, fall semester and I'm excited to see everyone uh, in person hopefully more and more at these events like Rick said we got uh, NAB we got uh, uh, Adobe Max which I know Kyle who is running stuff behind the scenes amazingly thank you Kyle uh, he's going to be at Adobe Max and I've heard that we might possibly be doing a little something here at School Motion to coincide with Max and I personally will be at uh, NAB in New York City. So if you're in New York, be sure to come out and say hi to me and all the Maxon crew out there. I can't wait to, to get back in person and see everyone and, and all that good stuff. But uh, that is it for us. Uh, hopefully we'll be doing more of these workflow shows more and more frequently after a long hiatus there. But it's so great to connect with everyone. Thank you so much for everyone who is in the chat asking all these amazing questions and hanging out with us. It's always fun to nerd out with uh, uh, all, all of the nerd family here in chat, Cinema 4D and Maxon and all the uh, great stuff going on in motion design. Things are changing so fast these days. Uh, but thank you again to Rick. And uh, we'll see you all here uh, next time, hopefully real soon. Thanks, Until CJ. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Go out and make something. Yep. <laughs>